So welcome, everyone. I know we are kind of at, towards the end of KubeCon, so I hope everyone had a great KubeCon. Uh, super excited to be presenting at my first ever like in-person KubeCon outside of the co-located events, so uh, super excited for that. And super also excited to introduce the WebSimly working group to the masses um, for today's talk. So if all of you are interested in learning more about WebAssembly or are working in a cloud native uh, startup or in a project and are looking at ways in which you could in, like, you know, introduce WebAssembly uh, or are just curious about WebAssembly in general, uh, this talk will be curated for all of you and will be helpful. And hopefully by the end, uh, you'll be motivated enough to join the working group and like just help uh, you know, increase the adoption of WebAssembly. So I'm Shivai, I'm a developer relations engineer at Millisearch, and with me we have Kevin, who is a director of engineering at Synedia. Over to you. Sure. All right, so let's see. It's the uh, last day of KubeCon, two o'clock in the afternoon. Everybody's in a food coma. So uh, who wants to see some really cool demos? Yes. We have none of those. So uh, <laughs> the agenda here, basically what I want to do is cover what WebAssembly is, why we should care about it, um, what it has to do with the cloud, and then we'll get into the CNCF uh, WebAssembly working group and you know, some of the things that we'd like uh, you to do to uh, help out and contribute. So actually, before I get into there, did, did anybody attend the co-located WebAssembly event earlier this week? Okay. Uh, who here has deployed WebAssembly somewhere not on a browser? Okay, well, you don't count. <laughs> All right, so uh, not too many. So WebAssembly is a stack-based virtual machine. It is designed to be portable, secure, small, and fast. And uh, coincidentally, those are pretty much the main criteria we have for deploying uh, applications in the cloud. So when we say portable, that means that WebAssembly is CPU and OS agnostic. It can't access the operating system, the kernel, file system. I'll explain the little red asterisk there later. Um, you can interpret the WebAssembly code or you can uh, JIT compile it into native code. It all depends on your needs. Uh, WebAssembly modules are not supposed to be used as uh, shared libraries. They're not a replacement for DLLs or .so files. And uh, at least for when you're building on Rust, there are two different uh, target types, one for regular WebAssembly and one for WASI. And I'll get into what WASI is in a minute. So uh, as far as security, as I said, it has no access to system resources, uh, can't make syscalls, can't access files, uh, kernel instructions, I.O. And again, there's a, a little bit of an asterisk, but um, I'll cover that. You can't do things like uh, create a buffer overrun inside a WebAssembly module. It's physically impossible based on the instruction set to tell a piece of code to jump to uh, a non-code instruction somewhere else. And uh, for those who've never had to try and troubleshoot those things, uh, that, that being something that isn't physically possible uh, is uh, a tremendous weight off the shoulders. You can use custom sections inside the WebAssembly modules. Uh, basically, they're just arbitrary piles of bytes. Uh, but a number of the runtimes, including a couple that you'll, that you'll see here at the CNCF, uh, use those custom sections for things like signatures and security metadata. And the, the host in a, is the thing that runs the WebAssembly module. So you probably know that the, the browser is a WebAssembly host, but what we're here to talk about is uh, cloud-native runtimes being the hosts, and those are the things that get to tell uh, whether a WebAssembly module has access to something or not. And by default, it has access to pretty much nothing. WebAssembly modules are tiny. 
uh, depending on the language that you're using and what exactly you are doing inside that function. Uh, some of them are uh, you know, less than 64K. Uh, WASM Cloud is a, uh, one of the CNCF WebAssembly runtimes, and you can generally deploy a service in under two megs uh, using that framework. And one of the interesting side effects of WebAssembly being small is that the act of deploying it is no longer a, uh, a big, huge thing that happens once and then never again. Because they're so tiny, you can deploy and redeploy them over and over again. And you can take them and move them from one place to another in order to optimize for compute or uh, proximity to data, um, anything, anything you want, really. Uh, the other thing that, uh, that workload size or lack of workload size gives us is that you can cram a whole bunch of compute into a really tiny space that makes WebAssembly modules ideal for running in embedded environments on IoT devices as cloud functions or edge functions. Uh, but you also can save a ton of money in terms of utilization. When you're deploying everything, uh, I realize this is a Kubernetes conference, but when you deploy everything in Kubernetes, there's a, you know, a utilization penalty that you pay for pushing everything out as Docker images. There's always that, you know, some unused bit of that Docker image, and I've seen systems where that's upwards of 90% unused. Uh, but with these WebAssembly modules, uh, you can uh, pack them in as densely as you want and um, try and maximize or optimize for utilization. So, as I mentioned, it's a stack-based virtual machine. I'm not sure if that phrase actually means anything to anybody, but uh, in short, what it means is that it doesn't need to make as many stops while it's interpreting the, the code. And one of the additional side effects of the way that this particular stack-based virtual machine is written is that it can start executing at the top of the module while the back of the module is still streaming in. So uh, in a lot of coding environments, you need the entire executable in order to start working on it. But with WebAssembly, you can start at the first instruction and start moving forward while you're still streaming the rest of the file. So that uh, is a, a really interesting way to uh, optimize your startup speed. Uh, like I said, you can pause and resume these modules easily because their, their active memory is just a pile of bytes. So if you wanna pause it, capture the bytes, resume it, and just shove the bytes back in. So there are three main kinds of WebAssembly that people are actively using today. And it falls into three different categories. The first one is freestanding WebAssembly. The, other one, the next one is WASI. And the third one is components. And freestanding WebAssembly basically means that you have a WebAssembly module that has no dependencies and doesn't import anything, um, you know, anything esoteric that requires things like uh, JavaScript shims. There are a pile of uh, demos out there showing WebAssembly doing all kinds of interesting things like running Doom and all of that. Those are tricks, smoke and mirrors done with JavaScript. Uh, WebAssembly on its own can't actually do those things. But it's perfect for running workloads in the cloud. WASI, and this is where that red asterisk comes in, is a standardized set of imports that your WebAssembly module can take. And if the host runtime supports it, uh, it'll, it will provide an implementation for those imports. And uh, WASI gives you things like being able to write to a file descriptor, read from uh, an environment. It's not the actual operating system environment. It's a simulated one. 
uh, read and write to a file system, but again, it's an isolated sandboxed file system. A lot, one of the big mistakes people make is thinking that, well, I can just take my existing application, compile it as WASI, and then uh, everything will just magically work. And sadly, that's not actually the case. Um, at some point in the future, that may be a more reasonable statement, but right now, e even if you're using WASI, the code that you write needs to know that that's actually what you're doing. You can't just sort of uh, blindly write to the network and hope that your WASI module will work, will work properly. And the third is components. And components, um, has anybody actually heard about WebAssembly components? I see you in the back. Um, okay, so the idea behind WebAssembly components is that you already have these tiny little pieces of compute that you put your business logic in and they are secure and fast, and uh, you want to be able to deploy those. But if you can define uh, a, a, the, the interface between any two components with a uh, standard schema language or uh, description language, then you don't actually have to have these tightly, coupled uh, these tightly coupled dependencies between WebAssembly modules or even between the host. So for example, one of the things that, that we're trying to do with components is define standards like uh, web server, uh, messaging or message broker, key value store, object store. If you build your WebAssembly component to those well-defined standards, then in theory, you should just be able to pick up your WebAssembly component put it in one environment and it runs, take it from there and put it under another runtime and it still runs. Uh, one of the demos that uh, Bailey Hayes did during the WebAssembly conference uh, earlier this week showed just that. It was uh, a Wasm Cloud um, runtime and a Fermion runtime and I think just running Wasm time from the command line. So all three of those worked and it was the same component that hadn't changed across uh, all three of those environments. And it's the, it, it may finally be that write once, run anywhere promise that we were, we were promised but uh, not delivered on by the, you know, that other language. So the WebAssembly landscape has grown quite a bit uh, over the last, I don't even know how long the, this thing has been uh, tracking, but I remember when the, there, there was no landscape and uh, people would laugh at me when I said that WebAssembly was ideal for the cloud. And so now we have a bunch of different languages that support WebAssembly, a bunch of different runtimes, everything from, uh, like I said, Wasm Cloud, uh, there's uh, Fermion's runtime, uh, there's a bunch of low-level runtimes, there are ones that are optimized for being run on embedded devices. Um, the idea there is that as long as you're writing to these well-known standards, you should just be able to shop around and pick whatever runtime is best suited to uh, your application needs. And so what we want to do with this landscape is hopefully encourage people to get involved and contribute and to help us reach uh, that point in the future where WebAssembly isn't uh, this big, heavy technology thing that everybody needs to worry about. It's an implementation detail. It's a checkbox in the compiler, and nobody has to worry about it again. So what I want to show real quick, I know I said I didn't have any good demos, but I do actually have a demo. So um, the first type of WebAssembly module that I talked about was this thing called freestanding. And I have a single function. Um, this is in Rust. Does anybody have, does this uh, syntax conf confusing to anybody or is it fairly straightforward? It's, it's just an add function. I add two numbers and return them. And there's a little tag on here called no mangle. All that really does is tell the compiler to export the, this function. So 
theoretically, if I do, uh, I'm going to do this without a cheat sheet. We'll see how well that works. Uh, did I do that in the wrong order? There we go. So WASM time is going to yell at me because I'm doing something that they don't plan on supporting. But way down at the bottom, you can see that I've exercised this machine's massive compute capacity to return 2 plus 2. But the interesting part isn't that I'm, I have a, a simple function. The interesting part is that whatever this function did, it's portable and uh, fast and efficient. And I can take that module with no dependencies, no node modules directory, nothing like that. And it'll run anywhere there's a suitable runtime. Uh, let me see if I can show the. So if I were to strip all of the unused stuff off of this, it comes in at about 300K. So there's another, um, there's another type of WebAssembly module where instead of exporting individual functions in what typically is called the library pattern, you run your WebAssembly module as if it were uh, an executable. So you just you run the module and it invokes the start function in that module and then it runs to completion. And this is a pretty common pattern for things like web servers where you run the, the module in response to one request. Um, but there are countless other uses for it. The main thing to remember with these is that they are limited entirely by the host. So if I run it and, and the host doesn't enable standard I.O., my application will have no I.O. If it doesn't enable file system access, my app has no file system access. So again, this is an incredible demo that I'm sure you've never seen anywhere before. But what's interesting here is that I've taken this WebAssembly module that technically does not have operating system access or file access or anything else, and the runtime has granted it secure access to a standard I.O. pipe. And so that allows me to do things like uh, display text. Um, I had originally planned on showing a component demo, but uh, the component model right now is in a pretty heavy state of flux. Uh, there are breaking changes to the contracts, the code generators, and the runtime almost on a weekly basis. So um, long story short is I couldn't get the demo working. So yeah, I think that's pretty much what I wanted to cover was just the basic introduction to what WebAssembly is and uh, what it looks like to use. All right, uh, so thanks Kevin for that amazing demo. Uh, I know like what uh, Kevin mentioned is that uh, we're not, we could not like make the component model uh, demo work, but if you're interested, just type Bailey Hayes. Uh, we have had some amazing demos done by her. Uh, she works at Cosmonic with Cosm Cloud as well. Uh, so you can look at some of the Cosmonic uh, based, or some of the web component uh, based model demos at Cloudinate WasmCon and WasmIO. Uh, but of course, uh, today we are kind of speaking about what exactly is the context for uh, WebAssembly in cloud. So we, of course, uh, you probably might have heard this term that WebAssembly kind of started off as a browser technology, but we soon realized this entire idea of being able to this, just run this WebAssembly model anywhere in the cloud uh, without having to worry too much about system dependencies. Uh, that meant that 
uh, you can basically take care or you can essentially use these WebAssembly models very efficiently in server-side and the cloud ecosystem as well. And according to a lot of the recent surveys, uh, you will actually see a lot of usage of WebAssembly outside the browser in server and serverless and cloud ecosystem. And I think like, some of the biggest uh, reasons where you'll actually see a lot of WASM usage is primarily on edge, uh, virtual machines, communities, uh, so being able to directly run uh, WebAssembly modules uh, in communities. We'll be talking more about how that is being implemented. And of course, if you are coming in from a traditional Kubernetes background, being at KubeCon, uh, how you can leverage uh, WebAssembly. And also of like talking about uh, workload orchestrators as well. Uh, so, of course, like, we'd like to officially introduce the WebAssembly Working Group. Uh, at, so, of course, uh, there, is, there has been this WebAssembly Working Group that comes as part of the W3C. So, if you're not aware, it primarily deals with the standards of the web. Because, of course, WebAssembly started off as a browser technology back in 2018 uh, with Mozilla folks. Uh, so there is a dedicated WebAssembly working group, but that kind of deals more in general with the WebAssembly standards and how it's like kind of operates in the web. Uh, but of course, uh, this WebAssembly working group within the CNCF is more dedicated towards uh, WebAssembly and its adoption in cloud and in the cloud, cloud native ecosystem. Uh, so it comes under the tag runtime. So if you're not aware, uh, the technical advisory group for runtime kind of deals with the different type of runtimes that we kind of see in the CNCF. Um, and I think we started off back in June. So we had our first ever working group meeting back in June. And uh, I and a few other folks were part of the initial charter where we kind of were defining what is the mission and how the WebAssembly working group uh, you know, will be utilized. So this talk is primarily dedicated towards understanding like what are the main missions for this working group and how all of you can also join in case you are interested in uh, you know whether you are uh, end users of Kubernetes or you are contributing to WebAssembly, uh, you're contributing to WebAssembly or even to cloud native ecosystems or cloud native projects and how you can leverage WebAssembly support in these projects. So uh, the primary uh, mission for the WebAssembly Working Group is just to help enable WebAssembly uh, to be able to run workloads uh, related to communities, edge computing, and other cloud native ecosystems. So the idea is to help uh, different cloud native projects that come under the CNCF to help adopt WebAssembly as a potential runtime uh, in comparison to your standard containers. Of course, uh, you might have heard, hey, like, can WebAssembly replace containers? Uh, that's not true, but idea is to help kind of run them side by side or identify those particular use cases where containers might be a bit too slow. Because as Kevin kind of pointed out, that these WebAssembly modules are very small. They are not going ahead and you know being deployed with any dependencies. And of course, the cold start time for uh, these WebSim modules is pretty quick. So if you're especially like running any workloads in edge compute where you're limited by the amount of compute uh, as well, and of course, uh, you, you don't want to probably wait for you know, uh, your standard containers to spin up, which can take more than you know, a few seconds to do that. Like That's where you, you'll be getting a lot of benefit of running WebAssembly. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, the other point is, of course, like we have already started to see a lot of WebAssembly being integrated in different type of CNCF projects. So, of course, the landscape, and you can just go to Wasm landscape for CNCF. Uh, we've already seen uh, a lot of different adoption. Uh, so, whether it's with open policy agent being able to use WebAssembly to basically uh, decrypt and be able to, you know, work with these policies and address them directly in in the client side or it's with Dapper uh, where you're able to directly get support for WebAssembly, um, or of course it's being used in Envoy and you know, different type of service meshes where it, you can essentially use WebAssembly uh, to create operators and uh, just have this one single binary that can now serve across multiple languages. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of usage uh, in already in the ecosystem, but of course the one of the main missions is to help further adoption for those projects who might be looking at WebAssembly, but they are kind of in, in a you know, catch-50 for like whether they should adopt it or what are the use cases. So really just helping define clear use cases where WebAssembly will work and where it will not be working. 
so that is why all of you can join the WebAssembly working group if you are kind of in that spot or in, you are looking to at least look at WebAssembly in the future. So uh, the WebAssembly working group will be working very closely to help define use cases for different type of uh, cloud native projects. Um, of course, uh, with any working group, there is you know the entire folks who help kind of define and run it. So of course, uh, since it uh, is part of the tag runtime, uh, the liaisons is, uh, are Ricardo and Heber, so they are the folks who kind of started off. Uh, and you can actually reach out to these folks uh, in case you ever want to get involved with the working group or you want to actually collaborate with the working group, right? So the TOC liaison is Nikita, uh, and the working group chairs are David, Justice, and Daniel, and of course the technical leaders are Angel, Kevin, uh, Kevin with us, and Sven. So you can reach out to these folks on the uh, CNCF Slack if you want to, like, you know, have deeper discussions around how you could you know, leverage the working group. Uh, so yeah, feel free to reach out to these folks. Uh, of course, as I mentioned, some of the deliverables is primarily just uh, helping document and implement uh, a lot of the cloud native WebAssembly use cases. So I think like one of the most important points to kind of note over here is that as we are, you know, whenever we are talking about any new technology, right, uh, there's always uh, this question of how do we implement it, right? And I think like one thing that like we'll probably agree is that the use cases are something that are still not very much defined because of course we're still kind of evolving as a technology in the CNCF landscape. So one of the deliverables would be to create documentation and use cases on how people can actually adopt WebAssembly for their workloads if you are in the CNCF landscape. Uh, and of course, like providing continuous updates, uh, that's what we are doing over here at KubeCon, but also you'll find a lot of like WebAssembly conferences, including the Cloud Native WebAssembly Day. Uh, we have uh, recently uh, introduced the WasmCon, which, is uh, which was at, you know, by Linux Foundation. It took place just a couple of months back. Feel free to take a look at uh, a lot of the videos because that particular conference actually captured uh, WebAssembly not just from the Cloud Native space, but also actually captured a lot of use cases. So if you're interested to know how it's being used in social good or in certain companies, then uh, definitely like, you know, check, check that out. Um, and of course, like providing a lot of proposals. So as WebAssembly and WASI are kind of expanding, so there are a lot of different, um, you know, proposals being written. So re very recently we had the uh, proposal for uh, the garbage collection uh, coming into picture. There's still a lot, of, like, a lot of other proposals for debugging, for networking capability in WebAssembly that are still ex like, you know, kind of maturing right now as we speak. So coming up with new, uh, you know, new proposals, like we are in talks of like having potentially a tracing proposal that might come in the future. So if you're interested in all of that as well, that's what you know, the working group will be working towards. Uh, and of course, uh, primarily the agenda that, you know, uh, so we kind of meet every two weeks uh, on Tuesdays. Uh, one of the major agendas for, all, for the working group is to introduce the different CNCF uh, WASM projects. So of course, uh, if you might, again, go back to the landscape, there are a lot of different open source WebAssembly projects that are now currently being incubated into the WebAssembly, uh, you know, the entire WebAssembly ecosystem under the CNCF. Uh, so I have been a long time contributor to the WebAssembly runtime called WASM Edge. That, that was incubated just a few, you know, months back. Uh, so the agenda of these meetings is really to just introduce new WebAssembly uh, related projects that can be beneficial for, you know, the CNCF e ecosystem. And of course, uh, develop specific workloads for communities. So I think look, one thing that we didn't specify until now was that now you can actually run WebAssembly workloads directly in uh, Kubernetes itself natively with the help of the WebAssembly run, uh, shim, right? So earlier we had the containerd shim, but now we have the containerd wasm shim that allows you to run your WebAssembly workloads side by side with your standard container workloads. And again, you can uh, feel free to take a look at the projects such as Run Wasi, which allow actually uh, allow you to actually do that. So some you know AKS and some of these providers natively now support you to be able to run uh, Wasm workloads directly in uh, the communities as well. Uh, so yeah, primarily just talking more about like how interoperability uh, in terms of like cloud, cloud native ecosystem, whether you're talking about like uh, WebAssembly support in service mesh, in Dapper, in uh, you know the standard Kubernetes scheduler, uh, so core Kubernetes or you know any of the ecosystem uh, changes and how WebAssembly will be supported. That's what we're primarily covering. 
And in the few months, uh, you know, since the working group has gone live, uh, we have been able to actually cover a lot of like major accomplishments within the CNCF landscape. So of course, we kind of started off with standardizing the WebAssembly landscape uh, that you see right now. So of course, earlier it was kind of hit, hit or miss, but we have spent a lot of time and the CNCF itself has really invested a lot of time. Chris from, you know, the CTO at CNCF has personally invested a lot of time. Uh, we had the Wasm Con as well. Uh, but, uh, but outside of that, uh, if you talk about core communities, uh, we have been working a lot, of course, outside of the uh, run WASI project that allows you to run Wasm workloads. Uh, a lot of work is also going on into the Kubernetes sh uh, scheduler extensions uh, so that Wasm can be directly supported over there. But also a lot of work is going on in, in the underlying architecture for uh, being supported, like uh, the containerity, containerity Wasm shim, but also how you can basically have native support with OC uh, and with Containerd itself, uh, and pro like you know, have uh, in basically support for projects like Project Yuki, uh, so that those can also support WebAssembly workloads natively. Um, and that's some of the things that you know are there. Of course, uh, with machine learning, a lot of work is going on uh, to help make ad advancements in uh, being able to run machine learning workloads either as serverless functions with spin. Uh, or even like being able to run like large language models directly on edge applications with uh, projects like Wasm Edge. So a lot of like machine learning uh, stuff is also happening uh, within you know the ecosystem. So if you are interested in like machine learning workloads, running them with WebAssembly, that's also some of the things that we have covered so far. And of course, uh, the biggest question is how can all of you get involved? Uh, that's what you know the main agenda for today's talk was. So you can join the WebAssembly Working Group Slack channel, and again, uh, feel free to take a uh, you know click of this uh, of this particular slide. Uh, so we are mostly having discussions around that. But of course, there is uh, within the CNCF Slack. We have the WebAssembly channel as well and the RunWASI. So if you are more interested towards like general WebAssembly, uh, you can join that. But of course, if you are interested in understanding more use cases and how you can adopt WebAssembly in your uh, own project under the CNCF, feel free to join that. Uh, we have weekly calls on Tuesdays. Uh, all of these calls are also, of course, published on YouTube. So you can take a look at some of the existing ones and you can join the mailing lists that comes under the tag runtime. And of course, you can always contribute to the different uh, CNCF wasm centric projects as well. Um, and these are some resources. So the first one is just the uh, you know the official uh, working group. Uh, you know uh, basically uh, the mission and the objectives that we kind of want to cover. Uh, the next one is just some meeting notes that we have had from the previous working group meetings, and uh, of course the landscape itself and the recordings of some of the previous meetings. Uh, but yeah, like I know we are uh, running out of time, but we'll be more than happy to take up any questions now. Uh, and of course, you can reach out to me or Kevin on the working group Slack. Uh, but yeah, you can scan this QR code to give any feedback. Yeah, and we'll be open to questions now. I think we have time for one or two questions. Um, does WebAssembly offer a good alternative to um, uh, scale to zero um, function solutions like AWS Lambda? So I guess it, the classic answer is it depends, right? Um, it really depends on how you specifically define scale to zero, but because of the, the tiny size of these modules, uh, in some cases they don't consume any resources while they're actually up and running anyway. So if your definition of scale to zero is consume nothing, then in some cases they can actually consume nothing while also being ready to take requests. Um, it depends on the runtime and how that's all configured, but um, yes, the scale to zero stuff is easier and faster with WebAssembly than it is with trying to dispose of a full Docker image. And for this, I think you can definitely check out Spin by Fermion. I think they are kind of uh, in this space. So I'll definitely recommend you to check out Spin project. Yeah, Wasm, Wasm Cloud does it as well. Yeah. It has scale to zero in it. In the context of using WebAssembly as a runtime executable, I was wondering if there's been any talks on building a GUI toolkit or some kind of interface to an existing GUI toolkit to be able to run desktop applications in the runtime. Yeah, that's a. They're tackling the easier uh, contracts like 
the, the various cloud dependency ones, so key value, message broker, all of those things. The hard part with trying to get a WebAssembly module to control a user interface over an abstract contract is defining that contract, right? We've been, <laughs> we've been doing that wrong for decades. So uh, it is possible. I've seen some people try. Um, there are some things where it's, there are a couple of frameworks, uh, some in Rust, that uh, give you the ability to have these declarative UI frameworks. And when you compile your WebAssembly module, it can then you know, manipulate the, the browser DOM, things like that. Uh, I, there's also, uh, and I'm blanking on the name, but there's another uh, contract that uses a frame buffer. So it's basically your, your WebAssembly module is asked for, you know, uh, essentially a bitmap every 60th of a second or so. But there's no, there, there's no one good solution for user interface with WebAssembly. Thank you. Hi. Um, so let's say we've got some application code that needs to use calendars, date, time type information. We have ICU, which of course the data type or data tables alone are like 30 plus megabytes. How does, does WebAssembly and the WebAssembly runtime have any way of plumbing information like that in so we don't end up with 30 megabyte WASM files? I'm sorry, I had a lot of trouble hearing uh, some of the, so you're trying to, were you asking about time or? Yeah, like date time. So we've got business logic that uses date time information. Uh, that of course uses ICU data tables and ICU to do things like um, daylight savings time and. and, and yeah, and generally uh, with WebAssembly, and again, it depends on the language too, because some of them do some of them do fancier things. Uh, there's a bunch of things in Rust that, that are designed specifically around that problem. But the short answer is the WebAssembly module has to ask the host for the time because the module itself cannot ask the operating system for the time. All right. So that'd be through like WASI and then that would, could do the computations. Uh, the the, the WASI has a standard for supplying time to WebAssembly modules. And again, depending on which language you're using, like if I, if I built a, like that little hello world, I probably should have done that. A little hello world uh, demo that I showed that was compiled to WASI. If I had printed the current time, Rust would have translated that code into something that asked WASI for the host time. All right, thank you. All right, thank you everyone.